Hello, everyone. Welcome to MAVA's third webinar of 2023, uh, Innovation and Intensification of Anaerobic Digestion. My name is DJ Wacker, and I'm today's moderator, I'm a member of the MAVA Board of Directors, and also on the Programming Committee. We have three presentations uh, during webinar today, approximately 20 to 25 minutes for each of those. And we're going to wait to have the questions, uh, Q&A sessions at the end. So uh, if you have a question for a speaker, please, please use the Q&A feature within Zoom at the bottom of your screen and submit the question. I do ask that you actually uh, uh, type in the speaker's name. So when we're going through them at the end, we're able to uh, determine you know, uh, which speaker that was intended for. Um, so without further ado though, we're gonna go ahead and get into our first speaker. Uh, and that is Dave Perry, Vice President um, with Jacobs. Uh, Dave is one of the experts in solids processing and innovator of several patents to enhance the performance of anaerobic digestion. He is a registered professional engineer in several states and provinces. He's earned his bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering from BYU and his PhD from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He has more than 40 years of experience in providing sustainable solutions for wastewater solids processing and energy projects. Dave, please take it away. Thanks, DJ. Yeah, today I'm going to focus on the enhancing anaerobic digestion, particularly with both thermal and biological hydrolysis. The uh, and let's see, and so I'll discuss the you know the research that uh, we've been doing on enhancing digestion, particularly with the addition of the microbial hydrolysis process, and just what is it, and uh, what's the CBSEI where and how uh, did we test MHP, and including with the thermal hydrolysis process, how we, we took a, a high performing system and, and then made it even a higher performance. What were our findings and how can it be applied at, at, at full scale? CBESI is short for Caldocellulose Eruptor Besi. It's a hyperthermophilic anaerobic diet, uh, anaerobic bacteria, and it's capable of hydrolyzing recalcitrant organic materials, particularly waste activated sludge and uh, cellulose. Uh, it, it's very good at breaking down uh, cellulose. It thrives at 75 degrees Celsius. It was first isolated in a geothermally heated freshwater pool in Russia back in 1990. And uh, it's readily available uh, people, it, it's, it's no mystery. And then I show a picture of it here. Just I highlight a few. All those little dots you see in there are the CBSCI. They do a little wiggle. This is at a thousand times uh, microscope. And uh, you can look at it and see that it's, that it's alive and, 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 and doing well. The process itself is... Uh, basically circular hydrolysis or recuperative hydrolysis, uh, thickened sludge. You, you, you feed the digester just as you would, whether it's mesophilic or thermophilic, and uh, getting the gas and the biosolids, and then taking the digested sludge, bringing it to the MHP tank, where it converts the volatile solids to volatile fatty acids, and, and then returns those fatty acids to the digester for, to then have the methanogens convert them in, into biogas. Uh, it two dated uh, hydraulic retention time at a neutral pH. And then, as I mentioned, it, it thrives at 75 C. So, you know, uh, keeping it in, in that range, 72 to 78, it's, we found that it's extremely resilient uh, and that's just where it, it, uh, it, it thrives. But it, few key things, and the two-day detention time is, uh, it can be longer than that, but there's not as much benefit having it longer, and it can be shorter and still still perform. And then uh, it's compatible with all processes, uh, including thermal hydrolysis, and that's where we, we did the test, the pilot test, on a thermal hydrolysis system, and then adding this in. You can see how you know, THP is done before digestion and the MHP is really incorporated in a recuperative uh, type uh, hydrolysis. 
the, the key results, more biogas and, and less biosolids. Uh, MHP using Sebasti, we've tested both lab and pilot scale. Lab scale is located at, in Gresham, Oregon, and 10 liter digesters, five liter hydrolysis tanks, automatically fed, uh, recorded, mixed, heated. And then the pilot scales, 1200 uh, liter digesters, 500 liter hydrolysis tank. That's basically a 300 gallon digester and 140 gallon hydrolysis tank. You see the digesters on the side insulated, there's feed tanks between them. And then the hydrolysis tank there is, is to the right, uh, insulated, uh, mixed, uh, and, and heated. We did the tests at uh, three facilities, and, and we've done more since, but these are the ones that we have the data on now. The Gresham is mesophilic digestion with a significant amount of fog added. The existing performance is 60%, and the method we used was lab scale. We also did it in Sina Wastewater Authority, mesophilic uh, digestion. Again, a high performing, already getting 60% BSR and did that at lab scale. The pilot scale we did was at the Clinton River plant with the, uh, at Oakland County, Michigan. And uh, it's a thermal hydrolysis process with mesophilic digestion. And they were getting a 58% uh, BSR. Pilot. So you notice all these are high performing. These are some of the best performing digesters and that's, that's where we uh, started. This just shows the configuration for the, for the lab scale. It's an, an Aerotech um, a model, lobster model. And then this is our pilot digestion, all in a, in a semi-trailer uh, with the process room in the back, isolated from the control room. Everything in the process rooms, explosion proof and uh, ventilated, and then uh, control room is where the PLC and uh, compressors and, and controls were. In, in pilot testing, we, we found that the CBSCI grew approximately 100 fold in 48 hours. We, we inoculated, it shows where I'm inoculated, this is during COVID, that's why I have the mask on, not for the CBSCI. The, uh, we were very careful uh, you know, to keep the temperature up after sh we shipped it and, uh, and then kept it uh, temperature with the, and then uh, and then inoculated. I was doing it there with a peristaltic pump. I finally found that that wasn't necessary and I simply just poured the bottles in and the short contact with oxygen air was, was not a problem. That's Maddie fairly waxed. Looking at the microscope after, after the two days, we uh, we we put five liters in the 500 liter hydrolysis tank. We and 48 hours later, we took one drop from that tank and saw all those little uh, little microbes. There are the Cebesii. We we saw that it it uh, it completely populated the same concentration as what we inoculated with. Uh, when we, we fed at 100 to 1. We were pretty excited that day. Uh, primary measurements, you know, all the standard uh, tests that you do for a digester, you know, of course, the feed and circulation rate, we measure temperature, total solids, volatile solids, uh, BFAs, alkalinity, pH, uh, occasionally ammonia, and the... Uh, and we have the lab that tested their full-scale digesters do the tests on, on the pilot. And then this is the, the result. The, the, the key part is the, the first, first phase. The, uh, and then we try different uh, mixtures and feeding and acclimation. But uh, we, we found that the top, top line is the red. It's showing the balsa solids reduction. And the solid line is what the full-scale digesters averaged. And, and then the blue is that we had a, both a test and a control. And the control, uh, we, we were concerned because we saw the control also increase and, and 
with the test. And the, as you can see, the test got over 75%. And, and so then we, we changed some things because we saw that the control was all up there. But then we, we later found that the control, unlike the test, had dropped out solids that, that looked like it was getting better BSR, but it was just dropping out solids in the, uh, in the digester, control digester where the test didn't. We had uh, similar results for the other uh, facilities. And so the 60, 60, 58 that were existing at Gresham, we, we saw a VSR that it achieved over 80%, the Encina 77% and Clinton River there at the 75. So all significant increases over already uh, well-performing digesters. To show some more pictures of Oakland County. That's their biosolids building on the left, the THP Canby system in that building to their digesters. And then the digesters are behind the pilot. That's the pilot facility that, that's set up there uh, in between the digesters and the biosolids building. Uh, we've done a, a basis of design, conceptual design for how this would be installed in their system. So this, this shows the their sludge comes in, it goes 3D watering, THP goes in the circulation loop. That's where we could pull off of that into the uh, MHP tank and then put the hydrolysis in so that it would be fed. And then uh, there's a cooling heat exchanger that's already there for the THP system. They operate in series and uh, that would just you know, augment and enhance the system simply putting on a tank uh, that they could also use as an equalization tank because it's not that sensitive, doesn't have to be right at two day uh, detention time. What they're doing right now at, at the Pontiac uh, Clinton River plant is there, uh, we're just finishing the design of the cogeneration engines that will use the additional gas or size for the additional gas. They already have the three boilers to provide steam for the THP. And they've chosen to put the cogen unit in first. And then the plan is then to, to put in the MHP tank uh, later. I just got back from uh, Denmark uh, last week and where the VCS Denmark, uh, Idsby Mole uh, uh, facility, and I butcher that name, so that I just refer to it as VCS Denmark. Uh, but they're already uh, uh, not only energy neutral, they, they produce about 150% of the uh, electricity and the heat they need. They sell their steam and hot water into a district heating system, and they sell their electricity into the grid. Uh, they are uh, we're conducting tests there, BMP tests on their sludge with uh, CBSCI. They've succeeded in uh, activating and, and, and growing the CBSCI there. And now we're doing uh, biomethane potential tests. And then this is where they, uh, in this lawn area, these are the digesters. This is where they would put two MHP tanks and we have a conceptual design. And uh, after confirmation of the, the business case, which looks very good for them, very short period for, you know, payback period for the amount that they'd uh, cost for these tanks and the heat, heat recovery, uh, they plan on proceeding there. This shows their existing system. Uh, and in yellow is, is what MHP would be added with the heat recovery. It's simply adding a tank, uh, a second one for a spare, and then uh, recovering the heat from, uh, uh, from the MHP, pulling from the digested sludge going into the feed. And notice this is already existing. They recover heat from their mesophilic digesters already. So this was very, they were very comfortable with doing the same with the MHP. And then I just show here a, uh, a system at full scale uh, that serves 300,000 population equivalent that you'd see an annual savings of 450,000 a year uh, with the 40% more gas going from a 55% VSR, which is a good performing 
uh, dodgers. That's actually what they uh, uh, perform uh, at uh, BCS Denmark up to 75, getting more gas. This is very conservative on the on the biogas value. Uh, most will get much more uh, value than, than this. This is like only like seven dollars a decatherm, and so there's really more of an upside. And then 30% less biosols because of the greater conversion with a 270,000 uh, a year saving. Again, this is conservative, which is uh, assuming $50 a wet ton, which many are and, uh, you know, paying more than that. But just trying to show that you know, even conservative estimates, there's a, a significant payback for a, uh, this is a 15 dry ton per day of facility. So, in conclusion, MHP, it can be added to any digestion process to enhance performance, decrease operating costs, increase in volatile solids reduction up to over 75%, you know, best performing uh, that I know of, and 40% uh, increase in biogas from already well-performing digesters, 30% decrease in biosolids production, and that's... That's the results. Do we have do we have time for a few questions, DJ? Or so Dave, we have two that questions the at the very end. Um, okay. So yeah, if you got, thank you very much. That was a, that was a great presentation. Um, and yeah, so I want to ask anyone, uh, folks that do have questions for Dave, please put those in the Q and A uh, chat feature, and we will get those asked and answered after the remaining two speakers. So. Thank you very much. We'll uh, move on to uh, our second speaker here. And that's going to be uh, Ian Pirro on high solids digestion for energy resilience and revenue. And uh, began his career at Delcora, where he ultimately uh, led environmental compliance for the authority. He then worked for a consultant at Isle Utilities, providing, um, as a consultant for Isle Utilities, providing innovation and technology consulting to leading clean water organizations. His current role Ian, is a business development manager at Energia, where he develops anaerobic digestion and biogas utilization projects. Ian has a BS in biochemistry from Villanova and MS in environmental science from Drexel. And he's a class A wastewater operator in Pennsylvania. Welcome, Ian. Okay, great. Thank you, DJ. Can I, you hear me and see my screen? Yes, I can hear you just fine. And yes, see your screen. Great. Yeah, so Dave's a tough act to follow. I'm not going to be able to top 75% VSR, but I'm uh, going to do my best to talk about high solids digestion. So, uh, yeah, with what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to provide just a general introduction and introduce the ability to operate digesters at higher solids than conventional municipal systems typically see to be able to increase the organic loading rate, and then go through two case studies who have used high solids digestion both to uh, increase their um, resiliency by uh, ha by having the ability to generate their own power on site. And then uh, in the case of the final case study, uh, a plant's actually able to produce renewable natural gas and generate revenue to offset costs for their operations. So let's kind of provide a general introduction of uh, who we are at Energia. Kind of our central mission is to uh, take on some of the largest organic waste streams of society and uh, provide a platform of solutions that can take these wastes and utilize them to be able to produce valuable end products like fuels and fertilizers. We uh, can take a traditionally uh, inaccessible feedstocks, anaerobic digestion like municipal salt waste and uh, extract the organic fraction and utilize uh, existing digestion infrastructure at wastewater plants to be able to take on the uh, uh, this material that would normally go to a landfill. So just to kind of, again, frame our conversation of why are we talking about high solids digestion? Why are we talking about um, trying to open up capacity at wastewater plants? Really what we're trying to do is we're trying to bridge the gap between municipal waste and wastewater treatment infrastructure. I knew that uh, when I was working at a wastewater plant, I never really had any interaction with uh, my counterparts over at the landfill or transfer station. And really what we're trying to do here is we're trying to uh, utilize existing wastewater infrastructure to kind of have a more circular approach to resource management where we see if we can divert materials away from landfills to uh, upgraded wastewater treatment plants with revitalized infrastructure and uh, advanced digesters to be able to generate additional value and really uh, convert wastewater treatment plants into resource recovery centers. So the issue with doing this today is that your typical digester at a municipal wastewater plant really 
was never intended for co-digestion of outside feedstocks. It was really just designed to be able to take some um, thickened primary and waste activated sludge up to about 6%, depending on how you're thickening, operating your digester at around 2.5% solids, and then generating some uh, class B digestate that would either be land applied or land filled, and then produce a little bit of biogas. And you can see here, you know, your typical or, or organic loading rate in municipal digester, you're around, you know, probably less than 100 pounds per thousand cubic feet a day. So we saw an opportunity, again, kind of with the lens of trying to open up capacity to be able to divert materials away from landfills to um, apply just the uh, trend that we've seen across our industry of process intensification, where we try to do more in a smaller footprint by concentrating the biological process. You know, you see this with putting IFAS media in aeration basins with MBRs. Is anything that we can do to be able to just maximize the performance of an asset? The only issue is with... Uh, with municipal biosolids, particularly waste activated sludge, there's a huge issue with viscosity. So you're fine operating a digester at around two and a half percent solids, but when you start pushing the operating TS of a digester at five, five and a half, six percent, you see you know, almost a tenfold increase in viscosity. So there's various ways that uh, you can overcome this, uh, this viscosity issue. You know, there's um, thermal hydrolysis, right? Which essentially is pressure cooking sludge upstream of a digester. So you can alter the properties of the sludge in order to be able to load higher solids into a anaerobic digester. You know, this works well, but you're applying a lot of steam and pressure and, uh, you know, it adds a lot of operational com complexity to the overall process. So we kind of took a step back and said, instead of looking at, you know, uh, what pretreatment we can do upstream of a digester, why not see if we can uh, address the issue, which at the end of the day is the ability to mix higher percent solid sludges in a municipal digester. So our approach is um, we thicken the uh, sludge prior to going into a digester. So you can see here, we almost feed it a cake at around 15% solids, thus allowing a digester to operate at around five and a half, six percent TS. So there's it leaving the digester. And uh, we're able to accomplish this with a specially designed mixing system that um, allows you to mix highly viscous materials. You know, again, kind of going back to the issue of viscosity, particularly waste activated sludge, you know, it's biological in nature, so it's cell membranes, and those membranes entrain a lot of water. And um, as you thicken waste-activated sludge past, you know, 5 6%, it's, it's a non-Newtonian fluid. It becomes very gelatinous and problematic to mix. So with our specially designed mixing system, which I'll get into in a minute, allows you to be able to mix those digesters at the higher percent solids, thus tripling the organic loading rate. So by feeding a digester at 12% TS and operating at around 55 your organic loading rate is now 300 pounds per thousand cubic feet a day. So this is a very, very similar performance that you would see with thermal hydrolysis, but instead all you're doing is using essentially a modified uh, screw press to be able to thicken the sludge prior to feeding and then operating and mixing at higher percent solids. So this uh, results in um, the ability to retrofit existing digesters, or if it's a uh, new construction digester, it can be about a third of the footprint. So there's two typical ways that we deploy this technology. One is with pre-thickening, where um, we thicken all the inbound primary and WAS to, again, about 12% solids, thus allowing the digester to operate at around 5%. This works pretty well if you know, your sludge piping is uh, pretty straightforward at a plant, but we find for a lot of retrofit jobs, it makes a lot of sense to feed a digester as is at the you know 2 to 6% TS range, and then use recuperative thickening, where you pump off a portion of the digestate you thicken it to about 12% solids and return it back to the reactor. So this allows you to operate a digester at higher solids without having to do any complex piping upstream. There's kind of pros and cons to each configuration. You know, for pre-thickening, you're saving a lot on digester heating because you're removing that water prior to going into the digester. When you do recuperative thickening, there is a little bit of heating loss as you pump out the digestate, thicken it, and return it. So to talk about the mixer itself, which really is kind of the core of why this works and why we're able to operate our digesters at, you know, significantly higher solids than you would typically see at a municipal plant. It's a uh, electric direct drive motor. So it's able to um, apply high torque directly to the uh, biosolids within the tank directly to the digestate. The mixer itself, it operates on a post. So you're able to adjust the height. And uh, you're also able to retrieve the mixer to be able to work on it uh, for annual maintenance checks without taking the tank offline, all with a total connected load of about 16 horsepower. So it's able to, again, effectively mix a tank at a very, very low energy usage. See here, there's two different blade designs that we use. The um, 940, we typically use uh, for the um, for 
um, thicker sludges, you know, uh, because you're able to have reach further into the tank. With the 1500, you get more thrust, but you have less range. So we typically see that with lower percentiles material. So kind of going back to uh, the actual, uh, again, not to harp too much on viscosity, but I think the viscosity of sludge is your limiting factor. Because if you think about it, you know, your organic loading rate is really a surrogate to percentiles, and percentiles is really a surrogate to the viscosity and the ability to mix the tank. So you can see here at your typical 2% solids digester at a silk plant, this is a project we did for the city of South San Francisco. And uh, they were looking at various mixing alternatives, you know, linear motion, pump mix, and uh, our uh, PSM mixer. And you can see here at the traditional 2% solids, you know, uh, all mixing systems had adequate performance, you know, linear motion was pretty much in line with uh, our power consumption at 100 RPM. Pump mix, you know, is uh, always going to be a little more energy intensive. It's just the nature of running pumps. We can see things get really interesting when uh, you operate a digester at 6% solids. So again, both linear motion and pump mix systems, they do a good job at 2%, up to about 3 maybe even 4 But uh, when you really start pushing the, the operating solids of a digester, the material gets very, very viscous in the tank. So you need a more advanced mixing system. And you can see here that uh, we were able to perform very, very similar to we did it to uh, the 2% solids in this uh, 800,000 gallon digester while maintaining a critical velocity of over four inches per second, which uh, is an important design parameter for us because um, every digester that we do, every mixing system is, uh, is all around trying to prevent fine grit particles from settling the tank. And we find that by keeping a critical velocity of uh, four inches per second or 0.33 feet per second in the tank keeps fine grit particles in suspension. So now I'm gonna go into uh, just a couple of uh, recent projects that we worked on. This is one that uh, we did for uh, the Camden County Municipal Utility Authority. It's an 80 MGD wastewater plant, uh, pretty much right across the Delaware River from um, Philadelphia. So the um, this wastewater plant didn't have any anaerobic digesters on site. They had they had four sludge holding tanks, and they were essentially taking their um, their uh, their unstabilized raw waste octane primary sludge, dewatering it, drying it, and and then trucking it off. So um, the um, facility was looking at you know. What is my what are the long-term biosolid objectives and plans for this plant? You know, and the, especially after Hurricane Sandy, they really prioritize the ability to be able to generate their own power on site in the event of another uh, extreme wet, wet weather event that might impact their ability to again power critical parts of the facility. So the uh, as the project currently stands, we retrofitted four sludge holding tanks into our high solids digesters. And it's worth noting here that uh, if um if they were going to go with the conventional anaerobic digesters that you know three percent solids two and a half percent solids they would need about nine million gallons of digester capacity so they would have to build additional tanks but by operating at higher solids and having our our high solids omnivore digesters they were able to accomplish the goal of having anaerobic digestion of having the ability to produce biogas with less than three million gallons of total digester capacity so it really tremendously helped the economics of the project by being able to use the existing concrete sludge holding tanks and retrofitting them into anaerobic digesters. We also um, supplied a, a 3.8 megawatt um, combined heat and power system too, which um, we actually operate for them under a long-term contract because their operators, while they were comfortable operating the digesters in the wastewater plant, you know, um, running a 3.8 megawatt biogas power plant tends to be outside of the scope of a typical uh, municipal wastewater operations. So, um, so for this, we were able to kind of de-risk the project and help them serve as a long-term operational partner and supply power back to the plant. So again, you know, it's a uh, activated sludge plant. Actually, it's a pure ox plant, so they generate their own oxygen. But um, before the project, again, all their sludge is being dewatered, dried, and trucked off-site. They have um, three thickening now where they feed their digesters at higher solids. They operate at high solids, and then they have a uh, biogas CHP system as well. Here's just some pictures of uh, the project itself. You can see that they were existing concrete tanks. Again, you know, going back to the theme of trying to utilize existing wastewater um, infrastructure, you know, we put, put on the steel cover. Here's the little uh, conduit that we use to put the service box for the mixer. And here's this picture of the mixer and then the service box of the mixer and the integration into the steel cover of the tank. Here's the biogas utilization system. Again, it's a, it's a 3.8 megawatts. You can see here, here's the uh, iron sponge media to take out H2S, and there's a uh, activated carbon for uh, both VOC and siloxane uh, removal on the back end, and then the two Yambacher engines back here. So here's another thing worth noting is that uh, they're able to go into energy island mode and power uh, critical 
loads of the facility if there were to be another uh, significant storm event. So it gives them the kind of resiliency. So much the output of this project was they're able to decrease their sludge disposal costs and also have more control over their own destiny with regards to energy utilization. Now, um, before I go into the next part where I'm going to talk about a much smaller plant, I want you to remember that this, this 80 MGD plant produces about 400 SCFM of biogas. That's important here because here's a 10.7 MGD plant, so a much, much significantly smaller facility out in uh, Victorville, California, out in the desert just outside of Los Angeles. Now, typically a 10 MGD wastewater plant doesn't have a lot of options to really do a uh, economically viable biogas project, to be honest. You know, it's limited infrastructure, you know, the size of the plant, the amount of gas that they're going to generate. But uh, the Victor Valley Water Reclamation Authority had pretty innovative leadership and thought, what can we do with our existing infrastructure to have the maximum both environmental and economic impact that we have? So they partner with Energia to be able to design, build, and finance strategic upgrades to the plant to be able to produce a biogas project. So the first phase of the project was uh, we took one of their 300,000 gallon digesters. Again, this is not a large facility. We retrofitted it into a high solids uh, on the board digester. We put in a high strength waste receiving skid, membrane gas holder covers, and two 800 kilowatt dual fuel CHP units. So the first phase of the project involved bringing in as much trucked in waste as possible and then allowing the facility to generate enough power to be able to offset the power demand of the process. So you can see here with this first phase of the project by taking about 20,000 gallons per day of high strength waste, this is everything from grease trap material to uh, store separate organic slurries that are available in the area to other types of food processing waste. And then there's 70,000 gallons per day of sludge. They're already generating 520 SCFM. So they're already generating about 100 uh, SCFM more than the 80 MGD plant over at Camper. So they were bringing in so many trucks and seeing a lot of upside for this project that uh, they decided that they would uh, think about what the next phase would be. And they wanted to build out a renewable natural gas project by taking their other digesters and also uh, upgrading them into on the board. So um, from this, we uh, did a second phase where we uh, put additional upgrades to these two uh, concrete cover digesters and then um, put an additional truck waste receiving infrastructure. And then we uh, put in biogas conditioning and upgrading. And uh, now they're able to inject their gas as a renewable natural gas directly into the local gas grid, thus providing uh, you know, just tremendous economic benefit to the project. So by uh, the, with the additional upgrades and now with the ability to take up to 60,000 gallons per day of high strength waste, they're producing over 1,000 SCFM. So now they're producing, this little 10 MGD plant is now producing significantly more gas than the 80 MGD plant. And um, this gas is currently going into the Southwest gas grid. So here's just a little overhead shot of what the plant looks like today. You can see that here's a tanker truck discharging a high strength liquid waste into the digesters. They have two high strength waste holding tanks right here. Here's our biogas system. Again, it's a biogas um, conditioning and take out H2S, VOCs, sloxanes, and then we have biogas upgrading. We have a membrane upgrading system, which we remove the CO2 to up the BTU value of the gas, and then it's injected directly into local gas grid as a uh, drop in replacement for fossil fuel gas. So um, I'm going to end the presentation just uh, talking about, you know, with that little plant, you know, that little plant, a significant of its VS loading is from outside waste. So this is um, some process trending that we've done with them. And um, for this slide, ADM means anaerobically digestible material. That's a high strength waste. That's the waste that's coming in on the trucks. So your typical, you know, really conservative wastewater design, you know, you hear that you can only take about maybe 20, 30 percent tops of your outside loading attributed or your VS loading attributed to outside waste. Well, through careful management of a digester and, character and characterization of the feedstock and having adequate high-performing mixing systems, you can see here that this Victor Valley is 10 MGD plant on uh, some days up to 60% of the total VS load is from outside waste, all while maintaining a um, volatile fatty acid alkalinity ratio well below 0.3 on most days. So it shows that through careful management of a digester, you can really have a significant impact, you know, that you would have way beyond you would typically see at a municipal digest. So with that, I'm going to uh, pass it over back to you, DJ. Thank you very much, Ian. Appreciate that. It was a great presentation. And yeah, definitely uh, interesting to see a uh, plant that small be able to accept that much waste and you know, produce far more gas than the 80 MGD facility. Um, but all right, 
so yeah, once again, if you guys have any questions, we have a few coming in for each um, speakers here so far, Dave and Ian, but if you have any more, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature and just getting over to our next and last speaker of the day, uh, which is Brenda Arce, uh, which is a, she is a treatment process operations engineer at UOSA um, and at, sorry, at the Upper Occupy and Surface Authority. She has attained a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Virginia Commonwealth University. Brenda, since joining USA in 2020, has obtained her BA Class II wastewater operator license. Some of her interests include biosolids recovery and process optimization. Outside of work, Brenda enjoys traveling and trying new foods. She's going to hear talk about desulfurization of mesophilic and over digestion using micro aeration, a full scale pilot. So, Brenda, floor is yours. If you don't mind uh, sharing your screen, we can get going. Thank you, DJ. Let me go ahead and get this set up. All right, I think you're good. And yeah, you're sounding a little uh, low in the volume. So try, try to speak up a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, I can go ahead and do that. Uh, just let me know if it starts fading away and then we'll, we'll take care of that. I can scream if we need to. All right, I think we're good now. Thank you. All right. Uh, so yeah, uh, like you just say, I'll be talking about disulfurization in the mesophilic and aerobic digesters at the UOSA plant. So a quick outline of today's presentation. I'll go through an overview of UOSA and a brief summary of what microaeration is. Then we'll get into the piloting effort results and UOSA's path forward. So for those of you who may not know, EOSA is a 54 MGD regional water reclamation facility located in Centerville, Virginia. We service the counties of Fairfax and Prince William and the cities of Manassas and Manassas Park. We are in the Occoquan watershed, which is part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And directly downstream of us is the intake for Fairfax Waters, Griffith Water Treatment Facility. As a result of our contribution to the reservoir and its indirect potable reuse, we have some unique discharge permit conditions. So this is an overview of the OSIS process. The facility has preliminary, primary, secondary, and tertiary processes, which include a highline process for phosphorus removal, recarbonation, conventional filtration, carbon contactors, and chlorination, dechlorination. Our solids process includes anaerobic digestion of primary sludge and fractional amounts of thickened waste activated sludge, dewatering, line stabilization, and two dryer systems that produce about 62,000 pounds per day of class A pellets. Uh, additionally, our chemical sludges are dewatered using filter presses and stored in our on-site lime solid center. So let's dive into the digesters. EOSA has three 1 million gallon mesophilic anaerobic digesters, each with seven mixing cannons. Several years ago, we did convert the digesters from a primary secondary operation so that now each digester operates independently, meaning our HRTs equal our SRTs. We typically run SRTs between 14 and 18 days, sometimes shorter. However, our primary objective is solid reduction for maximum gas production and throughput and not necessarily to achieve stabilization at the class B level. On average, we produce between 250 to 350 CFM of biogas containing about 60% methane, which we use for heating, power and CO2 production. The H2S content of the biogas ranges between 1400 to 2000 ppm. Therefore, to prevent damage or any operational issues with our combustion equipment, the biogas goes through uh, purifiers containing sulfur treat uh, to remove the vast majority of H2S. 
So here's a breakdown of how we are using the biogas. As I did mention earlier, our primary objective is to consume as much biogas as possible, preferably to fuel our cogeneration facility. The cogen is really a one-stop shop for us as we use the 848 kilowatts produced to offset power from the grid. The gas from the exhaust gas is collected and repurposed in a recarbonation process for pH control and heat from the exhaust and engine cooling water is used to maintain digester temperatures. In addition to our cogeneration facility, we have two boilers which produce heat for the digesters, CO2 for the process, and also provide heat to some of our buildings. Lastly, we have the flare, which often consumes excess gas produced beyond the cogeneration or boilers, or even to maintain air permit compliance if the cogen or boilers are unavailable at the time. Um, although the flare biogas does not require pretreatment, microaeration comes into play as we primarily seek to operate the cogen or boilers. So, what is microaeration? When we started looking into it, we found that most of the work had been conducted in Europe with a few here in the US, but I'm happy to hear that it is growing. The process of microaeration in anaerobic digesters consists of adding small amounts of oxygen in order to promote that sulfur oxidizing bacteria needed to create elemental sulfur. The dosages are relatively low and tend to stay below the LEL. As we investigated the chemistry and really got started, we wanted to target the limiting oxygen condition of half mole of O2 per mole of H2S. Uh, moving beyond that to say a one to one or a two to one ratio puts us at risk of thiosulfate and sulfate, which are limiting conditions for sulfur oxidizing bacteria or sulfides respectively. Additionally, our research also indicated that it could be added to the feed sludge or into the headspace of the digesters. So as we further investigated, here are the primary advantages and disadvantages we found. The advantages were low capital and operations, um, operation of a small compressor, minimal operator involvement, and relatively low O&M requirement. Some disadvantages were safety. Uh, this includes overcoming everything that you know the operation staff has ever been taught about oxygen and anaerobic digestion. You also have nitrogen dilution. So feeding ambient air can dilute methane production due to an increase in nitrogen. There's also tuning, changing in biogas production and H2S concentration sometimes can make it difficult to maintain that half mole ratio of O2 and H2S, and uh, there's also sulfur accumulation that could happen. So with, that, with all of that in mind, we decided to give it a try with the goal of reducing H2S concentrations to a point of making an impactful difference in O&M resource consumption. Since it was a trial, we elected to inject ambient air into our gas mixing system. We have a common gas system, so this was a good way to achieve what we believe is uniform mixing and distribution to all three digesters. We felt that if we had a problem such as overheating, the risks of to sludge toxicity would be reduced. We divided our trial into three phases. The first was with lower dosages of air below three CFM. During our first phase, we did notice what appeared to be a relatively short response time. So for phase two, we really tested the H2S response by cycling the system on and off to see how fast the system would reduce and stabilize or return to elevated levels of H2S. And in our final and third phase, we increased our air dosages upwards of 60 of them. So a quick overview of our gas mixing system for anyone who is unfamiliar. This is a gas piston system, which uses the eductor tubes. Each digester has seven cannons, about 30 inches in diameter each. 
one of which is in the center of our digesters. Biogas is fed into the bottom uh, into a bubble generator. Once that bubble is large enough, it releases into the tube and pushes the sludge in the tube upward and out. Uh, for our study, we use that bubble to transport the air to the headspace of our digesters. So what good is a study without data, right? So while we set out with a more rudimentary approach of does it work or not, since we have a fair amount of existing data collection through instrumentation, we did use the opportunity to increase our data through manual collection to gain a better understanding of what the overall impacts were. Uh, hence, we collected information on the biogas composition. Since we don't operate for stabilization, we aren't always monitoring the S reduction as an operating parameter, but we did feel it important to monitor more regularly during this study. Additionally, we performed periodic inspections due to concerns for sulfur accumulation as well. So this is an overview of our digesters. On the right-hand side, uh, in the darker lines, we have our sludge feed, recirculation, and transfer lines for each digester. And on the gas side, we have biogas collection from each digester into a common header which goes to utilization or the flare, and a portion of that is compressed and returned to each of the digesters for mixing. Just upstream of the compressors is our air injection point. Looking closer at the pilot system for phase one, we have a small air compressor feeding into an air separator, into a rotometer, and into the common gas header. For safety reasons, we did install a solenoid valve, which is tied to the run status of our gas mix compressors. So in the event they are offline, the valve will close and prevent air from entering the system and potentially creating a combustible point in that pipe. Um, and the check valve would also prevent gas from flowing back into unwanted areas. And during phase two, a second compressor was installed for the use at high dosages during phase three. All right, so on to results. During the lower dosages of um, air in phase one, you can see we reduced our H2S concentrations from about 1400 ppm to 1200 and just a little over 800 ppm, giving a 33% overall reduction. And in phase three, we see a larger reduction of about 57% down to around 900 ppm. Uh, something to note here is that during the pilot, we observed an overall increase in our H2S. Uh, you can see in phase one, we did start around 1400, but in phase three, we started off with the concentration closer to 2000 ppm, almost reaching 2400 ppm. And like I mentioned earlier, we did have this intermediate phase in which we installed the second compressor. So during this time, we wanted to test the response time of the system. Some of the research we had indicated reaction times on the order of SRTs. However, what we observed through gas injection was a much faster response time on the order of hours or days. You can see that on the graph here, when the air was turned off, we see a corresponding increase in H2S concentration in our biogas. With this graph, we wanted to show oxygen transfer efficiency at various points during the study. As you can see, at higher feed rates of air, we see a reduction in oxygen consumed, show by a higher um, concentration of oxygen in the biogas exiting the digesters. Now looking beyond H2S, what were the effects of microaeration on the anaerobic digestion process? In our experience with gas injection, we didn't really see any changes. You can see a pretty steady concentration in methane around 60%, while 
our volatile solids reductions were relatively unaffected as well, ranging generally from 40 to 60 percent, despite all the increase in air feed. As it was mentioned, sulfur accumulation was definitely a potential disadvantage and a concern going into the study. Here we have some pictures of some of our downstream piping beyond some of the general particulate that accumulated, you can see the hard yellow sulfur deposits forming. Um, and of course, if they form, it's pretty much always going to be where you don't want them. So in our case, it was in a few of the um, flame arresters for our gas mix compressors. So to summarize, we observed about a 57% reduction by volume in H2S at our maximum dosages, which was a bit off the mark. Preliminary research did indicate reductions as high as 80 or even 95%, but this may be more readily achieved with, uh, by using sludge injection. The advantage we did see was a very fast response time with oxidation occurring within 24 hours of starting air injection. At this time, we are unsure how sludge injection may change this. However, we did observe a reduction in efficiency at higher dosages, no real impacts on the digestion process. And on a positive note, we reduced our media change out over the period of the study from historically having to change out two purifiers to no purifiers, which ultimately translated to about a 65 thousand dollars per year in budget savings. So what's next for you, Osa, on the microaeration front? We are currently working on selection injection to see if we can increase our H2S reduction beyond that 57% we observed. We also hope to collect some microbiological data as we were unable to attain any in part one due to limited budget. And you know, as a full-scale pilot system. We are pretty excited to have the opportunity to do a kind of side-by-side -side study of both gas and sludge injection. Lastly, a few acknowledgements. Um, we worked closely with Dr. Kim Shea on researching other microaeration projects, data analysis, and really determining what the next steps were throughout the pilot as conditions changed and data was collected. We also worked with SUES, the manufacturers of our tin and mixing system, to gain a better understanding of the system and to assist with some of the data analysis as it pertains to the delivery and mixing of the sludge and air. Uh, we also have here uh, a few references for major literature research used in developing and operating the pilot study. And with that, I think I'm going to back to you, DJ. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Brenda. It was a very interesting, uh, I guess, uh, pilot study, I guess, in impl implemented full-scale study that you guys have done. So appreciate that. And yeah, I've heard quite a bit um, about that and I have a question myself, but we'll get into um, some of the previous questions that have uh, first been asked. And going back to uh, to Dave, uh, this is a question on dewaterability. So did you say how the dewaterability of solids from NHP is different from that of conventional high-performing mesothelic digestion? Is some of the saving attributable to reduced polymer costs as well as solids handling? Okay. Yeah, I, I actually didn't mention it, but we did do a test on the dewatering. The savings, uh, there would be additional savings for the improved uh, dewatering uh, the cost savings that I showed was just purely for the solids reduction and then the polymer savings for having to dewater uh, less uh, solids. We did, we did a test. We only, we only did one test, and that was on Gresham. And uh, they had very poor, even though they had good bolts of solids reduction, you know, 60%, their dewatering and belt filter presses were, were very poor, only getting achieving about 17, 18 percent uh, cake. And then we we sent that to Matt Higgins to Drexel you know, uh, lab and, and had them test uh, both uh, with and without the MHP 
and we saw that the uh, dewatering went up to 22% cake with the MHP compared to the 17 without. Uh, but it that that you know that that was in the lab and was encouraging. But we we fully intend to do more tests on other sludges and 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 see. But we we would expect just as you see in digesters when you get better volatile solids reduction and less viscous and uh, volatiles in your digested sludge, you tend to see better uh, dewatering. And and so that we did we did have one test that that showed that. All right. Well, thank you. That's um, yeah. That's I mean, it's quite an increase going from seventeen to twenty-two. But yeah, I'd be very interested to see that on a full scale. Um, you know, like you said, or even a uh, you know full scale pilot as opposed to bench scale. But um, so we're gonna skip around here though. We got a few more for you, Dave. Uh, I'm gonna go over uh, to Ian. Does viscosity revert to quote unquote normal when digested sludge is pumped to be watering centrifuges? Is there a practical limit of how thick you can maintain digested sludge to dewatering centrifuges or post is or is post dilution required? Yeah, well, first, the big limiting factor is just the operating percent solids in the digester. You're not going to operate a municipal digester over 7% without pretreated sludge. So that's kind of like your limit there. But yeah, if if the if the digester is leaving the digester around five and a half to six percent. We dewater via screw presses without any dilution at all. The only dilution will be adding some water if you're blending polymer. So that's a, but I guess it would just depend on the kind of centrifuge and what the, if it's a limited either, you know, from a solid standpoint, like solids loading or hydraulically limited, but it just depend on carrying up the right dewatering equipment. But really to dewater 5% solid sludge shouldn't be an issue for most dewatering equipment. Yep. Yeah, I guess it's just like you said, that you definitely have to check with the centrifuge that you have if it's obviously yeah. existing, then that's something that, yeah, you want to look at it from a hydraulic or solids loading standpoint. If it's new, then probably not much of an issue as you should be able to have the, um, you know, work with the manufacturer to select the right centrifuge there. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go down to Brenda. Um, did you say, did you see any adverse effects of nitrogen on your CHP engine? Uh, we didn't see anything major or anything that really stood out when we did select biogas uh, makeup uh, to see how much nitrogen was coming back around outside of the digesters. We only saw maybe two to three percent nitrogen. So I don't think at those levels people were able to see anything major like the, the CHP. Okay. Great. Um, all right, let's go back to you, Dave. Um, for the uh, let's see, case study at the plants that are achieving 55 plus percent ESR, is there any difference in anticipated performance when applied to conventional AD on secondary sludge only? Yeah, we, we actually tested that in the lab. And, and as you probably know, uh, conventional digestion of waste activated alone you're doing well if you get over 40%. If you get 40, 45, you're doing exceptionally well. And, and we, we tested that uh, because we were particularly interested because we, we knew that the CBSCI does well on, on the waste activated. We, we, saw also, we also saw VSRs up in the 75% on waste activated alone, indicating that that's, that's where the real benefit is. You know, it's, it's on the cellulose in the primary sludge, Basically, toilet paper, et cetera, and in the waste activated, it's um, it, it, it it the the CBSCI hydrolyzes that very well. What otherwise doesn't digest. So, yeah, we 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 saw almost a doubling of the VSR. Gotcha. And I, I'm going to go um, kind of just continue on that. And I'll be honest, you know, the microbial hydrolysis uh, seems like kind of a no brainer. It sounds almost like. Uh, too good to be true in the sense of just like hearing how well it can perform. Um, so I guess I'm curious as what are the you know major drawbacks or what's like preventing um, you know you or anyone else like any of the utility from kind of really um, you know make bring this full stream. Yeah, the the main main barrier is that it's new. You know, <laughs> you, the uh, we have it at lab scale, pilot scale. We do have a full scale at the agricultural. 
uh, a dairy manure uh, that, and that's, you know, the private sector is faster to implement new technology. So they've already built an, an operating uh, a system. We're commissioning it now. And the, uh, the municipal, like I mentioned, uh, Denmark, they're very uh, open to new technology. They, you know, they said, hey, well, let's do a few tests, but we don't need to do a pilot test. Let's get this installed. What's the What's the loss? They're just more open to that. Where um, then it, it's a new, new technology is probably the greatest barrier. You know that, it, that people want to see where's the three or four plants that where it's operating. You know, and and so we have uh, we 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 have several that that are interested or planned. We've got conceptual designs uh, and they're preparing for it and. That that's I think that'll reduce the the uh, the barrier when we you know, start seeing the new technology you know the, the installations going in it's kind of like uh, thermal hydrolysis until DC Water built the first one in the U.S. Hamby was trying for twenty years to you know they had it in in Europe but we, we got it in the U.S. and then it took off from there and I think the same thing would be be here when. When you can see it installed and operating, that gives people comfort. And I, I see that so, in the area right now. So I guess you're saying then there's nothing with the you know, CSEA themselves that are finicky, that are problematic, that make it operationally a challenge. Just it's just really no, and that, I, I'm that glad you brought new. that up because that that's what we saw in the you know in the pilot. Uh, I, I didn't mention it, but the shipping we we shipped it. Uh, uh, we had two shipments, and uh, this was during COVID. And one came five days later. We wanted, we had it the next day, and it came all cold and uh, everything. And and we found it survived. And then uh, I had a, a heated, the heated tank trying to you know maintain it at seventy five C. I came in one morning, and there's steam coming out of it. The coating had, had got on the the thermocouple and measured it like it was cold, so it kept putting on heat. So I boiled. Boiled it. I'm sure there was, and it, it came back even stronger after that, but I'm sure there were cold pockets. I didn't boil the entire system, but it, it, it was, uh, and then I mentioned in feeding it, it wasn't sensitive to oxygen. I mean, if you bubbled air through it, it would, but uh, it was resilient to, you know, casual contact with air. It was uh, resilient to high temperatures, low temperatures. It goes dormant in the, in the digester. And one of the things that I think uh, eliminates the concern and the barrier, it's a, a bolt-on process. All these facilities keep, can keep operating their system just yeah. as they operate it. And you just pull off and you know hydrolyze it and put back. Uh, and so at any time you can shut it off. So it only is an improvement. There's no risk of disruption to the process or anything. And then you, you need a you need a higher temperature heat source, but I've I've done the heat mass balance. You get more gas out at that more than covers the additional heat that that, that you need. So it, it's uh, I mean that that you know some of the unintended actions in a pilot uh, actually prove the resiliency uh, of it, and uh, and then that's just lately with uh, you know getting it to grow and getting it into Denmark. That wasn't a problem. We're working with uh, some of our clients in Australia. They're extremely strict on bringing uh, microorganisms into uh, into that country. Uh, and they they experience that with animox, et cetera. And so you know we're working there to simply get it across the border. The fact that it's a monoculture and not toxic or harmful to anyone, and you know, uh, and only e exists at seventy five and and growing and if you expose it to air, it dies eventually, you know. So there, there's a low, there's a very low risk to uh, to, to, to anyone uh, from it. it. It just it loves cellulose. Gotcha. All right, well, yeah, thank you. Though. That's um, it's great to know. And so, Amber, we're gonna go back to you. Um, what's the side stream effects of adding that much high strength waste to the liquid side of the treatment process? No context yeah. there, but um, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, whenever you're building a outside waste receiving business, it's, it's always important to carefully characterize all your inbound feedstocks to make sure that you're not exceeding your headworks loading for things like, you know, nutrients and stuff like that. But 
in the case of Victor Valley, they had the capacity and they're on the desert. So they're not discharging, say, like a Chesapeake Bay with a TMDL for nitrogen and phosphorus. So it's a little easier for them. But yeah, you would definitely have to be really careful about what you introduce into a digester. Make sure you have a good program to profile and track what goes in to make sure that you're able to, uh, you know, adequately treat any side stream from dewatering or anything else. So yeah, it's just a, really depends on the plant. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Brenda, a question for you on the, uh, and this is actually for myself and that I've seen, uh, heard some folks, you know, speak on micro aeration before, and I believe I've heard, uh, I guess a dispute or debate rather say that there's an unknown of whether the actual, I guess, desulfurization is occurring in the liquid phase or if there's actually some of it potentially happening in the gas phase. Have you guys talked about that with Dr. Shea or anything like that on, you know, trying to understand if it's truly happening in the liquid phase um, in terms of like, you know, that sulfur breakdown or if it's actually happening in the, in the gas phase? So we, we did have kind of that back and forth with what the research papers are kind of saying uh, without us doing the actual sludge injection. We don't know yet to what degree our actual air injection is going to change. So far as we've just added into the headspace, we, we can see it that it's happening in headspace 100%. Now, we know that there is an increase in the required O2 needed to have H2S reduction when we do feed into sludge. So it may be that it, in both instances you have in the sludge and in the gas phase, a small percentage happens in both, but there we don't have any concrete data yet to back any of that up. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm actually, I might I want to talk to you, I guess, after uh, maybe offline here, but I have a project in which um, when we're going to die to upgrade and they're doing a, um, I guess, micro aeration upstream is phase one die to project. And they've kind of halted that because pilot testing worked really well. And now that they're actually doing it full scale, uh, they're having some troubles, um, you know, with that. So I might want to you know, see what, you know, more in depth of what they're doing, what they're doing versus what you're doing with your guys, um, you know, full scale implementation there. So um, thanks for that. Yeah. Um, all right. We're going to go, um, I guess, back to Ian here um, for the Victor Valley project. Uh, you had 1,200 SCFM of biogas and 1,100 SCFM of RNG. Uh, what was the methane content, or why was the methane content so high in the biogas? So I, I wish it was that high, but I think if there's kind of a, maybe the slide wasn't clear. So the plant's currently generating about 1,200 SCFM of biogas. It's about 60 to 65 percent methane. So they're injecting about, you know, just under 800 SCFM in the grid. That there is the max size of the upgrading system. That's what the compressors to be able to push the gas to the upgrader are size for, for the 1100. So I think there were a bunch of numbers there on the slide, but yeah, it's a biogas production and then the max rated capacity of the compressors on the biogas upgrading system. So, but I wish it was that much and I think that'd be a great project. <laughs> yeah, I think we'd all be wondering how, uh, how that's going yeah. on there, so. Um... <laughs> All right, so another one for you though, um, and that is uh, for the energy of mixing system, is that typically operated with recuperative thickening or pre dewatering to get the high solids in the digester? Yeah, so we've, we've done both. For the case of Camden, that was pre thickening where we feed, you know, the waste activated primary sludge in, into a screw thickener and thicken it to about 12% solids. In the case of the Victor Valley um, example or a recent project in South San Francisco, we did do the recuperative thickening because it was easier for the retrofit as opposed to redoing all the sludge piping. So it just really depends on the application. Thank you. Um, and then Dave, I know you answered this one in the chat already, but I think everyone else should be able to hear it. Um, can you use MHP without THP was the question. Oh, with, without, I answered it, could you use it with? So yeah. Uh, yes, you can use it with and without, and uh, it's, uh, and again, you just, you know, basically the whole concept here is this, the MHP goes after the leftovers, the, uh, and so, you know, without THP, um, the, the, there's, there's still the leftovers in the, in the digested sludge, and, and that's, that's the other test, the, the Gresham uh, was without THP, and Cena was without and then Oakland County was with THP. And 
and so with or without it, it's uh, you you can you can do it you 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 get the additional benefit when you put THP in you get the benefit of the the reduced viscosity and the ability to feed a thicker solids and you get the you know, they get class A when you do it without THP we actually have a project where we're we're putting in the batch system so we can do time temperature you think about it 75 C is pasteurization temperature it needs less than 30 minutes and so we we keep it in for the the two days but we make sure it's not fed or withdrawn for 30 minutes then we pasteurize it and get class A where with THP it's already pasteurized so you don't you don't have to to do that so just you know some considerations when you uh when, when you do it that way but it, it's the uh, and on Gresham where there's so much fat soils and grease that's where I that's where I first came up with the concept hey I'm not going to do a pre hydrolysis uh, I don't need to on fat soils and grease digest well anyway I don't need CBSTI to break down fog anymore right fog digests 98 percent or so so but what I want is what doesn't digest and that's the cellulose and the recalcitrant you know waste activated and stuff so in all cases that's that's the target is just really dealing with the digested sludge of what did not digest and then giving that and that that was so exciting when we that hundredfold and we inoculated it, we only fed it digested sludge. So it had already been well digested. And the fact that it survived and not only survived, but thrived on it, we knew it had a food source, right? And we knew that it, it was going after what otherwise wouldn't digest. Gotcha. Okay. Um, all right, well, yeah, I think we have one more question that's for Ian. Um, on the uh, construction photo you showed for Canada, New Jersey, uh, retrofitting those digesters in the new silk covers, I uh, did not see a lot of access around the ports where the mixers were going to be mounted. Did they since add access platforms there? Uh, I guess, yeah, probably the question is what's the, what's really um, the means of accessing those if you're on kind of a slant, um, you know, slope cover like that? Yeah, there's uh, stairs that go up that kind of go around the digester. And also there's a building that's directly, um, their Saul's building directly um, connected to their digester building. So you're also able to get roof access from the building as well to go and serve okay. in the mix. So two different points, one gotcha. external, one kind of internal, yeah. Gotcha, and how long has that facility been operational? Uh, since uh, 2020. Okay. So, and be happy to give tours too if anyone wants to check it out. Great. Um, all right. Well, yeah, I don't see any other questions though. Um, so with that, I really want to, um, you know, thank our speakers today. Everyone, I want to thank everyone for joining. I think it's been a, been a great discussion. Um, so with that, um, yeah, thank you all for attending and we'll be providing copies of these presentations as well as a link uh, to the video, uh, coming a few weeks after this webinar. And we invite you to register for our upcoming MAVA, uh, summer symposium which is taking place July 19th to the 20th in Binghamton, New York. A uh, link will be posted um, in the chat here. And any more information, please see the MAVA website. Uh, so our next uh, MAVA webinar series, though, continues after that in September on Tuesday, September 19th, and that will cover phosphorus. Uh, please on the lookout for emails and further updates on the website from that. So once again, thank you all and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everybody.